how can one know that through which everything is known? How can one know the knower? Namaste. So the last time we talked about how consciousness is permanent, but its objects are temporary. And that applies to all four states of consciousness. Well, of course, in Turiya, there isn't really an object <laughs> because all there is is the self. And so there are no objects, nor does it become the object of anything else. So now let's look at verses 7 to 10 as we continue our analysis of consciousness. Ma sabda yuga kalpeshu katagam yeshvanekada no deti nastametyeka sangvidesha svayam prabha through the many months, years, ages, and world cycles, past and future, consciousness is the same. It neither rises nor sets, unlike the sun. It is self-revealing. The objects of perception change and differ with time, but not their consciousness or samvit, which is one, abiding and self-revealing. See Brihadaranyakopanishad 4.4.16. Self-revelation is not an act which would require an agent and an object, but a fact. The mere existence of the self is revelation. A consciousness does not require another consciousness to reveal itself and its contents. It is the ground or substratum of all experience. Hence, it cannot have a beginning or an end, or in other words, it is eternal. Verse 8. Iyamatma parananda parapremas padang yataha manabhuvang ibhuyasam iti prematmanikshate This consciousness, which is our self, is of the nature of supreme bliss, for it is the object of the greatest love, and love for the self is seen in every man who wishes, May I never cease to be, may I exist forever. We love our self, our very being, more than everything else, even our body. So it is supremely blissful or bliss itself. Sometimes people hate themselves. That is due to the hatred for some suffering through body, mind, etc., with which it is identified for the time being. The self appears to be hated due to its association with one or other of them. Verse 9. Tatpremat marta manyatra naiva manyarta matmani atastat paramantena Paramananda Tatmanaha. Others are loved for the sake of the self, but the self is loved for none other. Therefore, the love for the self is the highest. Hence, the self is of the nature of the highest bliss. How self is dearest of all is shown here. Verse 10. It tang sat parananda atma yuk. In this way, it is established by reasoning that the individual self is of the nature of existence, consciousness, and bliss. Similar is the Supreme Brahman. The identity of the two is taught in the Upanishads. So it is established by reasoning that the individual self is of the nature of existence, consciousness, and supreme bliss. This has Vedic support as the Upanishads speak of this identity. And the Upanishads say, 1. That Brahman is of that nature, and 2. That therefore the two, 
that is to say, the individual self and the universal self, are but one. So, consciousness is the substrate, the basis of everything. Without consciousness, there is no world, there is no individual, there is no body, mind, events, phenomena, huh? There is no action, there is no knowing, not even any consciousness in the sense of a awareness of an object. So without consciousness, the world cannot exist. That means that consciousness is the most essential thing. And similarly, consciousness or the self is the supreme object of love. There's that famous verse in Brihad Aranyakapanishad that one does not love the wife for the sake of the wife, but for the sake of the self. One does not love the husband for the sake of the husband, but for the sake of the self, etc., 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 until finally one does not love the world for the sake of the world, but for the sake of the self. Isn't it? And every conscious living entity, every sentient being, all the way down to bacteria and viruses, strive to protect their existence. This is another symptom of consciousness, that the self is beloved above all. Even in the Vedas, one is permitted to cause harm to another to protect oneself. This is the only instance in which such harm is permitted. So we can understand then that the self is the supreme sacred, the supreme existence. And with that goes the supreme power, the supreme energy, the supreme bliss, etc., etc., etc. The self or Brahman is everything. It has to be. This is proved by reasoning. And also, you'll see later on, by many, many examples in this wonderful book. So, how can we say anything beyond this? How can the psychologists and the neurologists and the neuroticists <laughs> spin up so many theories? Well, they hate the self. They're envious of the self. The self simply goes on enjoying no matter what happens. So because they are identified with the body and the mind, they resent the fact that they have to suffer. So they become envious. Envy is when one wishes one had something which is another person's destiny. In other words, it's impossible that you could get it. Huh? So that brings envy out. But in the case of the self, you already are the self. We just don't know it because we don't recognize the self and also we're covered by the identification with the body and the mind. So this is the reason why people don't understand the self. They don't get it. So they make all kinds of theories that are wrong, absolutely wrong. Why? Because consciousness being fundamental, more fundamental even than time and space, because for time and space to exist, consciousness has to exist. That's the meaning when we say that consciousness is the substrate. Everything else is built on top of that. So, consciousness, then, is the one fundamental thing that cannot be done away with. Otherwise, the whole existence would collapse. Consciousness without an object is Brahman, because there is no second thing. Brahman is one without a second. So, if there's no second, there's no object, no consciousness in the strict sense of the term, 
but only pure objectless awareness, awareness of awareness. Consciousness knows that it exists. You ask anybody on the street, do you exist? <laughs> of course, they're going to say, yeah, I exist. Well, how do you know that you exist? Well, I'm aware of myself, isn't it? Then if you ask them the third question, how are you aware of yourself? <laughs> how are you conscious that you're conscious? They can't answer. And of course, the actual answer is, your consciousness is reflected in your mind and intelligence. So you know that you are. Even animals know that they are. You know, just try to do something harmful to an animal. It's going to resist. It's going to run away or try to protect itself. See, this is because animals are conscious. Even plants are conscious. Now scientists have found that when plants are harmed or even threatened, they emit high-frequency sound waves that only other plants can perceive. And the same with their changes in chemistry and so on. Plants are aware and they respond to their environment. That means they're conscious. Maybe they're not conscious like a human being is. Maybe they can't manipulate symbols like we can using our intelligence. But they certainly are aware of their existence and will strive to protect it at all costs. So this is the primary symptom of consciousness, that one loves one's self so much that he is ready to sacrifice everything, even the body, to protect it. You might ask, well, how is somebody willing to do that? Well, what about a hero? When a hero is willing to go into battle and die for the sake of his country or some cause, or something like that. But that's kind of a crude example. A better example is at the time of death, when the body becomes useless, the consciousness automatically drops it and pulls away from it and goes and makes another body. See? The conscious self has all mystic powers, including the ability to travel in space and time, to create bodies, even to create worlds. Huh? This is Brahman. But Brahman is covered by the Upadis that, oh, I am a jiva. I am a conditioned living being born in a material body. <laughs> and we listen to that. We accept that. But especially in the beginning, we don't want to accept the explanation that you are Brahman. You are the self. But if that's not true, then why do we love ourselves so much? And I'm not talking about narcissism, uh, which is an unbalanced kind of thing where a person loves themselves so much that they're willing to throw everybody under the bus. <laughs> but I'm talking about a healthy self-love that makes sure that one is strong and healthy so he can take care of his responsibilities in life. This is the kind of self-love that leads to a healthy person, a healthy family, and a healthy environment. And this is the teaching of Sri Panchadashi. Aung Tatsat. Aung Shakti Aung. Aung Namah Shivaya.